This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So who here has actually uh, ridden in a bicycle race? All right. Um, who here has not raced yet, but is interested about it? A couple people? OK. Um, well, there's a dirty little secret. Um, you're never ready for your first bike race. <laughs> just, it's just a fact. Um, luckily, we brought in some professional help. Um, Larry Nolan is a USA Cycling Level 2 coach. He also uh, works at the USA Cycling Regional Camp Series um, that are all across the United States. Um, he's a coach for Team Specialized, and he's the director of the Early Bird Series here in Northern California, um, which uh, for those that have participated in it, you recognize it as a model for how to get intro introduced to the sport of bicycle racing. Um, he's also known in some circles as the Supreme Commander of NorCal Cycling. So. He's here to talk to you about um, preparing to train and race. Good evening. My name is Larry Nolan. Thank you for coming out, San Francisco. Um, preparing to race can mean a lot of things. So here it goes. Um, my name is Larry Nolan. We are going to cover um, a, a good amount of information. Uh, before I was a cyclist, I was a runner. and. Then I got married, and then I had a family. So I did it uh, in the opposite order. I'm not a professional like you've had Daniel Holloway up here uh, last week. Um, never been a professional, so don't know the pressures that they're under. But I've lived uh, bicycle racing for the past 25 years, and I absolutely love it. So uh, we've already done introductions, but literally we've got six piece. A little bit of perspective from my point of view. Um, it wasn't a FedEx truck, but I encountered a triple trailer truck while traveling around Lake Tahoe. And they are legal in Nevada. And I thought there might be some uh, nerd people like me. So I put the articulation joints if people want to count how many um, articulating joints they are in a triple trailer. But there's a lot. And it smacked me. Uh, and it pretty much changed my life. So talking about perspective, um, when I get on my bike, I'm not saving a life. I'm not changing the world very much, but maybe I can do my bit, and I would hope through this talk tonight that you could do your bit. And it might just be a little thing, like commuting a little bit more. So when they said, how many people have to ride the bike, I raised my hand, because I do. I choose to ride my bike to work wherever I go, instead of getting in the car. So today, got on BART, and it's not a good walk for me from BART, so I rode. It's not that, um, that I have to do that, but we all make these choices and therefore let's make them. So um, there are 37 million people, according to the 2010 census, in California. As we know, because we all love to ride our bikes, we've got just a bunch of things to do. The deserts to visit down here, Joshua Tree, lots of Lake Tahoe area, and beware of the triple trailers in Nevada. <laughs> We've got a huge amount of coastline and waters, and I will stay closer to the mic, sorry about that. <laughs> so there's just a lot to do in California, but I wanted to put this in perspective with 37 million people. We all ride our bikes for a lot of different reasons, and you probably have your favorite, but this list may include something or multiples of why you ride your bike. Just leave that on there for a second. Um, but again, keeping in perspective, mm -hmm. um, bicycle racing, again, the topic was to prepare you to race. Um, 
which can also be let's let's include something like a challenge uh, maybe a century ride or a 20 mile ride with the scouts or uh, an iron man um, but to um, respect the fact that some people do this a little differently and there's only 7,000 licensed racers so when when not many of you said yeah I've raced before or maybe we didn't even get to like who's renewed their license for the new year and all that good stuff there's currently in California there's only 7,000 which is the highest density in all of the United States for licensed racers that are on road track or mountain bikes this is current information it's not including BMX racers and an organization like Oregon which is separate from USA Cycling but there's only 7,000 of us in Northern California which is the area that we live in um, this was a nice little demographic of where these people are located which included um, Northern California and Northern Nevada these are the racing licenses in the district we race in and there's about 4,500 of those people and just being a little different all the people that race love their bike for the same exact reasons that you do but we also do it a little differently which is why the YouTube quote was put up there that sometimes we have this goal that's a little bit more itching than than people that just maybe have a goal of doing a century if you're trying to win a bike race it's quite tricky and to get all the variables right takes some time and patience which is why we're going to go through these things I love the introduction that that um, when you're talking about a first race being a good experience the likelihood is it's very small so we're we're here tonight <laughs> we're here tonight to go through that to hopefully improve that maybe that if you've heard of the early bird series and hopefully you've had because it has a whole lot of goodness to it that um, it is a great way to introduce people it's not the end all the very first day we meet with people we tell them that we're only gonna have about 75 minutes with you and then you can if you choose race and then we're gonna have about 20 minutes afterwards to talk about what happened now my wife who's a PE teacher equates us to something like okay class let's all learn how to snowboard and we'll we haven't really done this before but let's all get on that snow lift after 75 minutes of talking about it and maybe buckling in and learning how to fall and things like that and we'll go on the snow lift and let's all just wait because we want to make sure there's about 50 of us before we all head down together <laughs> right and that's kind of what bike racing is because we have some skill some of you come from uh, century riding or you know we've seen kids you no know, handed BMX they could you know they could turn their bike you know and do all sorts of things and we've had other people that are a little tense right when we're talking about having that first experience that's what we're trying to do tonight is get you to a point where you say okay I got something I'm gonna give back to the sport and something maybe I can learn if I try this okay um, then there's that I just put that down and italicized there's this teamwork thing right I'm a director of a junior team the team specialized boys um, there's nine of us from mostly the West Coast and um, getting people to understand that this is a team sport at a junior level at the elite level and obviously you see it when you're watching television because they only broadcast events that have teamwork um, it's something that doesn't it, it escapes the local level sometimes so that's what we're trying to do as well um, and then some parts get real fun the strategic and tactical people like when I get invited to a club to talk they just want to talk you know they just want to talk about like wow how, you know when this happens and this happens on the last up can I you know can I win the race and da 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 and you know I did this time and does it work again and you know that's fun but if you're not fit you can't play that game so um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that but mostly people that are racing are real competitive and I think we've got a light audience on people that are thinking of racing but so let's again get the perspective right of we're gonna be talking to some people that are like thinking like okay I can race but I also want you because this this transcends a few of the different levels when we talk for instance about assertive riding you don't have to be a racer at all I just came from BART on my bicycle 
with buses and trucks and cars all over the place and you have to be assertive. So when we get to that part, there's some good, and I don't have to be a racer to do that. But I tell you, it's the exact same thing because I've raced against professionals. It's the exact same thing when you're talking about at the last lap of a professional race, you have to assert yourself. So let's go to the other example because we're not there yet, but I'll talk about it anyway. If you're, most of you look like you're licensed uh, drivers maybe, um, they, when you're merging onto traffic and onto the freeway and you are sitting in the slow lane, which is what you're supposed to do, unless there's traffic and then you're supposed to pass to the left and then come back into the slow lane kind of thing. And if someone was merging onto the freeway at the same time, you have a choice. You can either slow down or you can, if there was room, you would pass to the left and you would just make it nice and smooth. And people that have driven in Europe, this is the way it goes. You don't move out of those lanes. You're not even allowed. It's not short trip, long trip. It is the passing lanes go to the left. So you're passing to the left, right? And if you are passive, if you just say, well, I'm texting, which a lot of people do, that's what we're facing as bicyclists now, or they're on the phone and they're in, stuck in this lane, now they'd say, oh, I don't like that lane because it's a lot of trucks and stuff like that. I'll just stay in this lane. And now all of a sudden, things are starting to back up. They become passive to what's happening, right? They're not necessarily engaged in the driving, but the same thing happens on the bike. So we'll get into that. So you've decided to race. This part, we're just gonna engage the people that are racing. The USA Cycling is the national governing body for, if, if somebody has that dream that I wanna be on the United States Olympic team, if they do it in wrestling, they have to go through this organization. If they do it in cycling, they have to go through USA Cycling. That's just the way it works. When people first race, they get a category five license and it just goes just like that. Five, four, three, two, one, professional. Daniel Holloway was a professional. I've never been a professional, so we're not here to talk about professionals. Okay, but we are here to talk about protecting your front wheel. So we're into number two, right? The P's. Love the P's. The best advice you can get when you first start racing, and I have to acknowledge, at the early birds, we've got a, a huge, huge amount of people that come out and volunteer. We're all a, an entire volunteer-based organization, and we, we go out there and we've got great people like Lori and Greg that have helped new racers to get excited about the sport and to realize that, hey, this is kind of fun, right? The very first thing you learn is how to protect your front wheel. And it comes in many different flavors, right? It is an art. What it means is when you're, and you can start this on your next ride if you want, if you're thinking of racing, maybe even next year, next January, you go to the early birds, or maybe in April, you go to one of Lori's clinics or something like that. If you're thinking of racing, you think about your next ride, what does it mean to protect your front wheel? We're not talking about a bubble around it or anything like that. We're talking about anticipating what may come across it, right? So again, if I go out into a bus and a bike and a car and San Francisco traffic, you guys get extra credit because you're not training on farm roads. You're training in the real McCoy. Things are happening out there, right? <laughs> the cable tracks and all this stuff. So if you're good at that, then then you know you can have some comfort and confidence but now what happens so this is where the early birds come together is we take this one person that maybe was confident another person that's confident and now we have to bring them together because now what you're doing is you're saying i'm confident in what i'm doing and then we go into predictable writing is you have to understand that there's another person as we maybe go through this corner together that may not do that same thing that you thought they would do, right? So now you have to go into communication. So there's a, a, a baseline curriculum that we go through in the first week of the early birds. And basically we're just trying to get people to be real comfortable. But it starts with getting some perspective. In week number one, we talk about, again, we're not saving lives and we don't have enough time with you to really make a difference. Just like tonight, we can talk about, we can talk about getting ready for bike racing but i would imagine even though a lot of you are really smart people and you can see the visuals and you can hear me you're also in love with a bike because you're a kinetic learner right you get out there and like give me something i can feel and that's a lot different than when i sit behind my desk and that feels good right so we we can 
you, you know, I can put a list of books that you could read, and there's really not them, that many on there, a list of books you can read on skills of bike racing, and you can watch videos, so you got the audio and the visual, but the kinetic is really what we're talking about, and that's what I'm trying to do, is you got to go out and you have to sign up for things, you have to engage with friends, call them up and get a group ride going, sign up for clinics, that kind of thing. So. I'm reemphasizing this one. Aggressive behavior in a bike race is not really toler tolerated. Passive bike, passive riding in a bike race. Let's just imagine 50 people in a pack. Someone gets a little timid and they say, well, I'll, I'll let that person in, I'll let that person in. And all of a sudden, whew, you are at the back, which in some races can be a great draft, right? All of a sudden you're just sucked along with this nice little atmosphere of things that are going along unless it gets a little hairy. But we're talking about being assertive. And assertive in week one of the early birds means where are your handlebars? If my handlebars are in good position, meaning they're not behind somebody's wheel, and that wheel won't be unpredictable, that's a good thing. So I assert my handlebars into a position where they're next to somebody else's handlebars, and maybe homework assignment, go and take a look at a favorite cycling magazine where two people are together and you'll see they ride fairly close together and they can get closer and more comfortable when their handlebars are that way. If they're not, let's say you happen to see a picture of an echelon where the wind is coming from the side, it's because they have a deep trust in each other. But for the most part, asserting means handlebar to handlebar. And then just literally the Famous cheer in cycling, bicycle racing, when you hear it, even in San Francisco, when there was the Grand Prix or the Giro in, in September is move up, right? So, and it is true. If you are not moving up, you're going backwards. Okay. Generally, so you can find this in a lot of textbooks, um, you're saving good amounts of energy, but just make it more current so you don't have to write that part down. Uh, Hunter Allen put out, I didn't bring the magazine, but um, he was following uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher in his power. So if you're not reading Road Magazine, Hunter Allen puts an article in Road Magazine every month. And uh, it's only on power. It's great stuff. Um, and he has been following Juan Antonio Fletcher. If, if people are remembering the visual, this is the the... He's talking specifically of that stage where the car came in front of the breakaway and put him into the cow field, which wasn't fun, but the data that he gathered from there. So Juan Antonio Fletcher is in a breakaway. He's got three other people that he is working with. So he is working one part out of four, right? So he's getting a rest. I'm not gonna do the math on, on who's doing more work than the other guy, because it's not exactly 25%, but when he is at the front, he's doing, and this is Hunter's quote, 400 to 500 watts. And when he's sitting in, he's only doing 200 to 270. Huge amount of savings. So again, let's go back to that example of if you got passive and you just kept sliding to the back of the pack, that might get kind of comfortable. This big old group and you're saving 60% of your energy, right? So um, the important part is maybe not to get too comfortable with that. Uh, on to number three, uh, it is fast out there. So we have some data from the early birds. This is uh, a Strava file for those who are asking the Strava question. Uh, I was out there all day long. The information on the bottom um, down here over to the left is my speed and my power, which for Strava it was estimated because I didn't have my power tap on. And then we're talking about a break and then maybe some mentoring and then another race where I jump in and out. And then later I came back and did the one, two, three race. But we're talking about the category fours at the beginning of the day are averaging 25 miles an hour. So people think like, I want to get into cycling. And then you go like, and this is the men. I'm sorry, there, were, there was a women's race. I was probably talking during that whole time. But... Um, this is just the men data, but they are smoking fast in January. This was not a warm day. Everyone knows warmer weather allows for faster speeds. This is, this is a January day, and these people are boogieing, right? So what happens here if we go to, again, I'm trying to talk about the art of 
bicycle racing. The science of bicycle racing is a lot of exercise physiologists and, and coaches are working with athletes to get them super fit, but they're not necessarily giving them the skills to race in a pack at 27 miles an hour, right? And that's what we're trying to do. And the, the, literally, there is no shortcut. You need to be patient with your signing up for races, getting a little of experience, Sign up for another race, get a little experience, talk to your friends, sign up for another race, get a little bit of experience. There's no, like, y you can accelerate the learning, but you can't shortcut it. So you can go to a lot of early birds, you can go to a lot of races, you can have different experiences, you can talk to people, and you can accelerate it, but you're not going to shortcut it. It's gonna take a while to get there. So if you're already, at, if you're in your gym, you're the spin person at your gym, and they say, well, you should try racing. That's probably what happens, right? A lot of people get, it's, it's flattering. They say, you're very fast. You should try bicycle racing. You're very strong. You should. So that's what we're trying to do here. Encourage people. This is on, that was on Strava. Um, another perspective we try to add at the early birds is that um, this is just one flat course with, uh, the corners aren't even real, so pe the, the speed is very high, which is why you saw the numbers as high as they were, 25 and 27 miles an hour. Um, so we're talking about there, if you're a tiny little person and you climb well, then you have to start talking to people about what races were suited for you. If you're not comfortable in a pack of 50 people, then sign up for races that don't have 50 people. There are such things. The climbing races for the climbers, the the less crowded races for the people that say, oh, I just want to start with a lighter group, right? So in Cycle Sport, another magazine, uh, this is an old picture, but it, it's, they profile the upcoming races and they say, who is likely to win? This is how they do their analysis, right? They say, oh, most likely this tour of Poland will be suited to the sprinters, meaning if you saw the course profile, there wouldn't be that many hills and all that good stuff. So. That's basically how the teams are gonna control it. Okay, again, more preparation. Um, targeting and preparing for your key events. I won't go through each of the seven scientific principles of training, but I do wanna to touch on specificity. This is a Strava file from uh, Old Man Nationals up in Bend, Oregon, where we had a downtown course. It was a short one, it was only that's well, not listed up there. It was one kilometer around. And my point here is that in this event, I've got spikes over a thousand meters, I'm sorry, a thousand watts multiple times, which is your training needs to reflect that, right? You go to a power meter course and they teach you how to read the power meter, how to understand power meter training. The the bottom line for this is when you're thrown into an event that's going to have a lot of accelerations out of a corner, and then it's gonna have some backing off and braking, you're gonna to need to prepare yourself for that. You have to do something to get specific to it. Um, so another P is practice. This is a, um, another Hunter Allen chart for um, it's it's useful information if you're training with power. Let's just leave it about that, okay? But it's also um, a way to to compare yourself. Literally, I could do more pushaways, and that would mean I'd be leaner muscle mass, and therefore my power would go up just by me being the same person. Doesn't mean I have to climb better. I probably would climb better if I could just do more pushaways, that kind of thing. Um, my daughter Aubrey. Uh, is also a coach. I won't read this out loud to you, but I will prepare for a demonstration. So it, it, last night it stood up all by itself. So I think it's gonna do it. Here we go. Oh, it doesn't. So the point being, <laughs> the, the point being is like, you have to have skill. This bike doesn't want to stay up by itself. You have to have skill to get this thing to do what you want it to do, right? It just, it's got about a touch pad of about an inch on each side. So it is not, the intention of the bicycle is that you've gotta take the skill of the body with it to make it work properly. So we don't want to um, brush that over lightly, 
but I played into um, two ways of looking at this. I played into, this is a picture from camp, which is something we try to get people to be very comfortable on the bike in day number one. Um, you'll get uh, young cyclists. This is a camp for young cyclists uh, that wasn't mentioned by Mark earlier, but these are 14 to 22 year old men and women. And um, they all come in because they know it all. They're at least a cat three, some are cat um, twos and ones, and they know how to race their bike, but they really have only been doing it for a few years. And we break it down and, and uh, get them some confidence, but also try to give them a dose of humility of the fact that they're not that good yet, okay? And, um, but they do get a little bit more comfortable. Uh, I used, and we're not gonna read these, uh, if you can read them, you're amazing, and you're still alert at 8.15 tonight. That's great. Um, but I used the fact that these were going to be posted online, and it was important to understand that these are competencies. It's, it's an old list from USA Cycling, but these are competencies of people just starting to race and what skills they should have before they upgrade to the next level, right? Then you go into the book further, and there's more of them and by the way this is a long list this is page one of 14 and i am now going to zoom through them but you can this is why these were posted online you can come back to them and understand that under the category of training knowledge these are some of the things you might know and learn with the psychology keeps competition in proper perspective again we're not saving lives here when we bike race has fun, right? Um, still psychology, goal setting, health and safety. I'm zooming out a little bit faster. Health and safety, training, competition, conduct, mm, sportsmanship, media skills. So even a CAD 5 can be sponsored by somebody and there should be an expectation that maybe they're doing something for that sponsor. Technical skills, we're on page 12. <laughs> More technical skills and tactics. Okay, so I, again, I to summarize that, I think skills are vital and I'm showing you this seven, um, seven snapshots, seven pictures of a, of, a, of a January early bird race that had a crash into it. And just real quick, like I'm gonna go through it kind of quick, but we're talking about um, the skill before we actually get to, the skill before we actually get to bike racing is basic skills. Like for instance, looking behind you and riding a straight line, right? The, the skill of doing a panic stop. Right, where you the arrows are on the three mentors. We wear these orange jerseys, and I obviously picked this picture because we all stopped, <laughs> which <laughs> you don't see us on the ground. And by the way, just as a joke, we ha we did have we don't get much media coverage, but we did have the local newspaper cover us once, and they got a picture of a mentor on the ground, and that wasn't so good. But <laughs> the media does things like that. But um, my point being with the skills is. We obviously need to take these very seriously. How many people have had an encounter with the ground, have met the ground and didn't really want to meet the ground, right? So the saying goes, for those who didn't raise a hand, there are those who have fallen and those who have yet to fall. So um, I wish you luck. I hope you can gain some skills. Uh, we do have, uh, Lori, do you want to give a quick announcement of when your next, Lori, La Lori Lee Lown has been running skills clinics for years. Okay, so Lori Lee Lown just really quickly told the whole group how, because it's not being picked up recording, so she told the whole group how um, for the past 10 years she's been teaching. Um, you can find all these classes uh, and clinics on getting ready to race and just getting more comfortable on your bike. That's probably the most important part it, on ncnca.org under the clinic section. Okay, um, another P is we have patience. Um, this is from the Canadian equivalent of USA Cycling. 
Um, and they, they, uh, this also applies to other sports. Um, they primarily picked this up for hockey because hockey is their number one sport in Canada. But obviously they want people to have an active start. But let's just say, and this happens, maybe some of you, I didn't start bike racing until I was 30, um, that you come in late and you are now trying to play catch up with people because um, maybe whatever reason, you just didn't get, uh, you know, if you were in hockey for years and years and now all of a sudden you're greeted to this bicycle and you love the freedom and you don't have your driver's license yet and all that stuff and you just love getting outside, maybe that's something, but you start to get more and more excited about biking and then you realize there's these kids have been doing this for a while and they're really good at it and they, they get sponsored and they win races and why aren't you winning races? So. Canada came up with this long-term athlete development plan and they it's just a great model for us to have a little bit of patience. Uh, again, me working with the junior team is we know that we teach them to train, but they think they're already you know ready to compete, right? And we have to be careful with these stages. We have literally 13 year olds on our team that have won races before. We have to remind them that they're still in maybe the, the, an 18 year old on our team might be in a different phase, right? To be patient with this whole thing. Maturity wise, these are two athletes from my team, a 14 year old and a 17 year old, right? I mean, it's like night and day. Marcus is now at Berkeley, writes for Mike Spike, another local team, same team that Daniel Holloway is writing for now. Uh, and Marcus is, Charlie's a tall person, but Mar Charlie goes to Princeton. Um, Marcus is about 5'11 now, so he's, He's grown, but um, there's no way that Marcus should ever sit there and say, I want to be doing the same things. I, you can aspire to be as good as Charlie, but you should not be saying, I want to go as fast as Charlie. I want to keep up with Charlie, that kind of thing. So the same thing happens with, with um, adults, because we're mostly adults in this room, that we need to, sure, push yourself, like Jim was saying, when you're standing next to somebody and riding next to somebody and climbing next to them, push them. But if they say, oh, I used to do the Ironman, you know, this guy's used to doing long races and he's, you know, he's going to crush us if we go on a hundred mile ride. He'll be good at 80 miles where we all be going like, oh my gosh, give me some more food. So um, let's just be smart about that. Uh, everyone has seen this. I'm sure it's maybe even been brought up in other classes, but they, your your patience into this sport literally starts with your goal setting process. Here's where I get a little controversial and hopefully wake some people up is uh, <laughs> Joe Friel put out a book, uh, Cyclist Training Bible. He's also got a triathlon training Bible. He's got cycling over 50 years old, things like that. And his are outlined in the block. And I've had a conversation with him about this and I disagreed with it because I was a working stiff and there was no way that I could come up with his number one is make your season goal. There was no way I'd say, well, I want to win, I want to go to the Olympics. Because, again, I work with kids and they'll say something like that. I want to I make the Olympic team. And then you find out their training objectives is, well, they're a full-time student and their parents expect them to get really good grades because they're trying to get into that school because they know that getting an academic scholarship is more likely than an athletic scholarship. So they've got that going. And then they're trying to fit in this. They're, so if you boil it down, they're really not able to devote that much time. So I say we've got to start with the training hours and then you've got to come in with this number three, which is have a sit down with your family, your loved ones and say, and same with you. If you go through the same list for your century ride or the death ride, I'm sorry, the California Alps ride, whatever it's called, and you say, I want to do that. You got to sit down with your loved ones because I've been married for 31 years and this is how it works. I just is is I check with her and then it, we're okay because it anyway <laughs> um, then you roll into okay how are we going to make this happen you this is now you get to the part where you can actually engage with a coach right the objectives and the priority races and things like that the first part you can do on your own you can say I'd like to do the death ride you start talking to some people how brutal is it oh well, it's brutal right so prepare um, anyway, just a little bit more on the preparation. Um, in summary, on the long-term athlete development, which is also called preparation, um, I would love it 
if people would stop comparing themselves to others. It just, it's, especially working with juniors and young athletes, is they always want to say, I, I want to do what they're doing. And you're discounting muscle memory and experience and all these other things when you're brand new to it. So I'm, I'm painting a picture of extremes of someone new and comparing to someone that's got a lot of experience, but I think it applies in between as well. Develop some smart long-term goals and then uh, practice your patience. Okay, here's a summary of six. Sorry that I had to click all six of them. So again, we're not saving some lives. Um, if you get a chance to take a clinic You'll understand more about protecting your front wheel. Um, these are the skills that we try to teach people. Uh, literally, it can save you, including when cars. So for instance, let's just go back to that basic skill, the skill that we had before we got to the early birds of riding down the road and looking back and holding a straight line, right? I'm just gonna paint this picture because it may have happened to you. I've had at least three encounters, including two vans, which were had marks on them afterwards, but riding down the road, a driveway comes up and I'm looking back because I assume that they're going to turn in that driveway because they don't see me. And sure enough, so again, goes back to, I'm going to give a double example here. If I get passive, then I just kind of wonder. If I get aggressive, that's where we get a bad name for the cycling community. So I just get assertive and I either need to sprint ahead and go, okay, they're on the phone and they're wondering about this address and I either get out of there or I assert myself by saying, okay, I'm here, buddy, can you see me kind of thing. So some way, somehow, but the default is they're gonna turn right into the driveway, right in front of me, if I don't do something. So I'm protecting my front wheel that way, just like we were talking about. Um, you're, if you're in the wind, you're, you gotta be thinking about drafting in position. If you're with a group of, um, I, one of my, Pet peeves is seeing a bunch of yellow jackets on the road because I live near the Dumbarton Bridge and they they go across the Dumbarton Bridge all the time and and they are spread out all over the place and they they don't draft each other they just they they're doing a ride which is great it's a social thing but they could be so more efficient if they could draft <laughs> each other I I'm sorry now you know why I'm a racer because I'm still goal driven I think just okay. <laughs> Um, you know, there are people that have crazy skills. So if you can do something to, you know, literally. So for instance, when you practice um, balancing on a bike with no hands, just your butt, right? You're, you're, you're clipped in or you're just standing in your tennis shoes because you might fall and you're just laying down and you're, you're doing a track stand with no hands. Or let's say you're doing a track stand with hands. What you're doing is you're practicing the fact that you have five contact points, right? If your hands are off, now you have three. If you're wearing tennis shoes, you're kind of less stable, but what you're doing is now you're focusing everything on the hips, which is a, a, gives a great amount of balance to your bike. And that's why you do things like track stands. That's why we practice a skill like that, or jumping on the rollers, so that we're familiar with the fact that our hips contribute a lot to the way that we're riding our bikes, right? Um, and then the patience part. There is, um, we're not saving lives. There's not a fire in the building. Um, so be patient with your training and your practices. And then as the wrap up, one of the safest areas to practice this besides the early birds it's a long drive but a lot of people from san francisco do this on wednesday nights uh, not every wednesday night but i promote track races down at the san jose velodrome if people didn't know there's a there's a velodrome where people ride with one gear and um, no brakes and um, if they're ready to race they take three saturdays to get comfortable you see a lot of fixed gear people getting comfortable and then they still have to go down and they have to practice getting comfortable with others. And then all of a sudden they're unleashed and they're ready to race. So um, it, it is, it seems, we got a few chuckles about the one brake, I mean the one gear and no brakes. But the fact is it's a lot safer. People ride more predictably. You can imagine nobody's gonna put the brakes on in the middle of the path. Yeah. So we all have to slow down together. We, 
what we do is we use the banking to slow ourselves down. These are some of the things we learn. But it's in the fields are so much smaller, so it's actually safer. Let's say 10 to 12 people, um, and it's uh, a, con a controlled environment. You have lights. It's like um, everything's controlled about it. A lot of good information on ncnca.org, including Lori Lee Lowndes, um clinics. A lot of information, in including how to prepare for your first race, is on USA Cycling. And then for next year, we have the early birds and the first four Sundays in January. And that is it. <laughs> Even the pros know how to have fun, right? Lots of information. Uh, any questions, right? So, so it, it's not easy, but let's break that down. So first of all, I mean, because this is what skills are, is breaking it down. So the question was, um, how do I get more comfortable maybe even doing track stands with, with no hands? And you break it down. You just build on the skill. So first of all, find a nice parking lot that's got no debris, a, a nice straight area, maybe even by the bay or wherever you happen to find that area. And then you're starting to... Um, so let's just go for, for the misconception here is that here's my handlebars. This is the same as no hands as this, right? So a victory salute is the same as this. When I'm going no hands, this we do at camp for people that can't get the, the no hands yet, is they have an out. They're close to the bars, right? So if, you're, if you've never done a no hands, start here. And then all of a sudden, you can do other things, right? Unzip your vest or whatever it happens to be. So you break the skill down into bite-sized pieces, clean debris, track stands, that kind of stuff. But it's not easy. I mean, some of these kids have crazy skills, crazy skills. Yes. So the question was, uh, with Strava, how do you stop comparing yourself to the fact that the data is just live and always out there and, and people are always tumbling above us, right? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll take a whack at it one way, is Strava, because I use it, allows you to compare yourself to your time. So if you go a little bit deeper, I don't have it pulled up. If you pull up on the left side, it'll allow you to pull up your previous run. So let's say you do whatever your favorite run is, and, favorite ride, and, and then you post a certain time, you can then go back and look at how you've done. So you don't, it doesn't always have to be to other people. In, this is key. So um, Joe Friel talks about it. It's one of my favorite uh, books is the, tra the Cyclist Training Bible is he talks about periodic field test. So what you want to do is you want to start with a benchmark and then you're going out and do the same course, which is easy to do because Strava is out there. And then you're getting these recorded times. So instead of let's just go real quick example. Instead of saying I do 10 minute efforts and I've done them last year and I've done them this year and I know I'm faster, a certain climb allows you to quantify it. And what you're looking for, to, instead of comparing to other people, is you want to compare your improvements to yourself. If you need to break away from Strava and put it on an Excel worksheet or you're in your diary or whatever, you go like, wow. I mean, my wife is 55 years old and she had a new PR a couple weeks ago in, on her three-mile run. And she's like, I mean, because she doesn't do straw or anything like that. She just has it in her diary, and she's like, there it is. Look at that. So um, that's one idea, just to compare yourself to you. It, I Just real quick, I've had the kids say, well, what happens when you do a ride and it's got nothing, right? No achievements, no milestones. <laughs> it, it's good. I encourage the kids once a week to take that garment and just put it in their back pocket. They can look at the data later, but just ride. That way you get a feel for how the ride is. And that's not easy for some people because we love our data. <laughs> question. Great question. <laughs> it, is, it is a topic unto itself. What is a watt? How do you measure it? And um, what use does it have? Uh, so basically a watt is a measure of output in terms of force and power, but it's also a measurement of how many calories it takes to do that, right? So a bigger person should put out more watts than a littler person, which is why I go back to some courses are not suited for the bigger person in climbing, let's say. Because um, I might put out huge amounts of wattage, but I can't make it up the hill like a little guy. Um, 
So what is it good for is um, the heart rate, just in capsulizing, it had a lag to it. always does, right? The people do the effort, and then there's this lag on where the heart rate is. And it, where the wattage, if it's a good calibrated system, whether it's an SRM or a Quark or a PowerTap or any other ones, if they're calibrated well, it's getting accurate data on the actual effort at that time. And what we're talking about is workload, and then a coach comes in and says, okay, I've seen your workload, and now I'm going to manage your recovery. So the important part, just like with the heart rate, is the for people that were doing the heart rate straps during the effort, the coaches were always saying, I want you to do the heart rate in the morning so I know what your recovery is like. I want you to do it at night. Tell me your resting heart rate, right? How are you recovering from this stuff? So it's an unscientific answer to your question <laughs> but it's a measure of of and it, it really is a class there are classes on uh, how to train people with power how to train yourself with power um, there are books on it uh, i am not the power expert okay one question and we'll call it a wrap oh i'm talking about meals i don't do enough push away meals <laughs> I do, I, I do push-ups, I do push-ups, but I don't, you know, like when you go, I go, second helping. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, we're under. Thank you. Thank you.